So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to be um, perhaps a little off topic because I'm going to spend most of this talk not actually talking about connected data. Um, uh, I want to address the kind of uh, more sort of um, uh, leading question, which is, well, what's the point of it all? If we're collecting all this data, in the end, we're doing it because we want to extract some insight or some knowledge. And so actually, um, what you do with the data is, is a key part of, uh, of what you need to think about. And, um, and I'm sort of working for the premise that a lot of what I see when I go into organizations is that the data science is just statistics, or even uh, less than that, it's sometimes just uh, a query that, that a lot of what people do with the data they've uh, spent lots of time building up uh, methods of storage and organization is just get it back again. So the whole process is just can you craft the right query to get some value back, or it's some really trivial statistics. What's the biggest value of X? What's the average value of X across uh, some retrieved data? So given my background of um, at Wolfram Research, uh, where we do things like Mathematica, the Wolfram language, and uh, probably the thing you know best, the, our foray into connected data is Wolfram Alpha, what we actually do is, uh, is, is try and unify computation. So my view on, on what we should be doing with data, what data science really is, is it's computation with data. And I want to kind of argue that that's a, a much broader thing uh, that unlocks a lot more of the value of all this data that you're collecting. And from our point of view, what computation is, is it's this big collection of different fields of knowledge that have been built up uh, over the years, some from the pre-computer days, things like statistics were largely designed before computers in order to reduce the computer, uh, computational complexity, but other areas like image processing that only make sense once computers came along, and uh, queuing theory and network analysis and all of these different areas. And what we're trying to do is to unify those so that they can be applied to the data that you're so diligently storing and organizing. And my central claim is that the data plus computation is a much greater value than data. And my sort of standard toy example is to remind you of the days when SatNav came along. Now, SatNav is the, possibly the most popular um, application of sort of graph data that there is. But actually, as a, as, as a, the data itself didn't really add much value over the paper atlas that we used to have on the passenger seat of our cars. What really made it valuable was the combination of the real-time feed of where you are now with the computation of route finding. If it wasn't for the ability to find the shortest route, SatNav would never have taken off. Now, these days, you've got all kinds of connected stuff like where's the nearest uh, um, pub and uh, amusement park and all of those kinds of things. But at its beginning, it was the computation on the data that suddenly unlocked the value that was previously tied up in paper. So I, just to kind of set the scene, I wanted to go through a few sort of toy examples. I'm going to do a few live computations through this, so forgive me if things go wrong. Um, you know, what are the things that computation gives us on top of data? Well, one thing is it, it actually unlocks the values in the data to do statistics on. So um, I was trying to think of topical, topical examples, and so, um, so I thought I'd scrape some information from the website for this conference, and I apologize in advance if there's any other speakers in the audience for the inaccuracy of facial recognition uh, computations, but what I've done here is I've just pulled all of the images from the website and then I've made uh, estimates using a neural network to, on the gender, uh, um, mental state, and age of the speakers. And now we've got something that we can do standard boring statistics on. So we can say, let's look at the age profile of the speakers at this conference and see that uh, it's sort of fairly normally distributed around 42. We can see how gender biased the, audience, the speaker set is um, and, uh, and, and what uh, the state of mind of people were when they were deciding to, to speak here. In the end, that's just statistics, but unlocking it takes serious computation. Now, another thing is being able to cross multiple domains of computation. So uh, there I resist strictly in the space of um, neural networks. But actually, you, by unifying computation, you can join up all kinds of different types of computation to unlock information that no one thing can really do. Um, so this particular example, I take one query from our knowledge base uh, of, of connected data. I looked up the image of uh, the Great Salt Lake from the satellite. But by joining up different types of computation, I can move through the different domains of knowledge. So we have here image uh, information. But from that, I can do image processing and infer a geometry representation. So here's a kind of uh, geometric two-dimensional mesh that represents the shape of the lake. Once we've got that, we can do things like solve differential equations over regions. So here's the eigenmodes for where standing leaves would appear in the lake, or what would happen if I dropped a rock into the, uh, the, the corner of the lake. Now, all of that can be kind of extrapolated from the, the 
the original data point, which in this case was just an image. Um, but we've actually touched on things that are engineering, that are uh, computer vision, um, that are visualization, and it takes the, the ability to join these things up to make it work. Um, another thing, and this is now starting to touch a little bit on, uh, on connected data, is injecting context. So the thoughts, uh, find another topical example. Here is um, the Transport for London data set that somebody mentioned earlier today. And as a data lookup, if I want to query, you know, what, uh, you know, what was the outcome of that accident on the sat Saturday, the 1st of January, and uh, who was involved, then, you know, just data retrieval is what you want. To get some insight, you need context. So what I can do is put that information into a, a, a geo context, perhaps the simplest piece of context I could have. And here's what uh, your risks are when you leave the venue here today. So here's where we are. Uh, if you turn right, slight risk. Um, if you head down towards uh, Elephant and Castle roundabout, then things get severely dicey. Uh, and we can look up the individual points. And, uh, and in fact, when I, until I looked at this again yesterday, this was fresh data when I ran this yesterday. Up until then, Elephant and Castle was the worst 100 metres in London. I see a new contender down here, though, so I'll have to find out where that is. Now, you know, putting stuff on maps is really uh, commonly done, but actually, even within this, computation uh, is actually quite important. Um, this one was easy. It was a nice, clean data set. But I did a project for uh, an energy company remediating spilt oil in the ground, and we had uh, topology data, and we had uh, samples from the soil in the ground. And, uh, and we looked at the data, and we were asking them to dig out ground that was underwater in the sea. And it was only when we looked at the sources of the data and realized that one set was in GPS coordinates, the other set was within ordnance survey, that we realized that there's a mismatch of 100 meters, which would have cost them about 50 million pounds in extra digging if, uh, if we hadn't spotted the weirdness of digging underwater. Um, so just the ability to align those things requires understanding of map projections. And there's, say, you know, 150 map projections. And uh, OS turns out to be some weird projection with a non-standard center. Um, so to be able to align the data sets uh, requires computation and understanding of uh, geodesic uh, um, references. Now, of course, you want to try and eliminate that beforehand if you can, but if you're taking feeds from multiple sources, you can't be in control of the way the data is stored. So the, just the unifying into an ontology is often computational. I'm going to skip over this one quickly because it's, I realize it's a dumb example. I've got this one backwards. Finance people are very excited when I show them this. It's taking some statistical data and showing how uh, a graph representation unlocks uh, knowledge about which assets are moving as a cluster. But you're all graph people, so uh, that's probably uh, kind of the obvious thing that you would do. But, as a, but the point that I want to make with this slide is that very often we grow up in a particular um, ontology uh, and our background. If we've come through the graph space, we know all about shortest tours and, uh, and, uh, and you know, centrality and measures like that. Uh, but you might not know anything about optimization or about differential equation solving or, um, or neural networks. And, and the ability to take computations from other people's domains and use them uh, on your own data uh, is, often unlocks insights that it takes automation to be able to use because you don't have the detailed expertise. So here's my second big point and my sort of central claim for what we do is that symbolic computation is the thing that unlocks this unification of computation and the ability to apply it to all kinds of data. Now, if anyone's used the Wolfram language, uh, they probably, um, you know, they're probably their first contact was solving equations and doing integrals in a calculus class at, uh, at college. And so a lot of people tend to think of symbolic computation as computer algebra, you know, getting a formula out instead of a, a numerical value. But I was told on my first day like, when I joined Wolfram 27 years ago, we don't do computer algebra, we do symbolic computation. And I thought that was just kind of marketing linguistics that I had to stick to, like a style guy. But actually, it took me a while to realize that actually it's the fundamental thing that makes what we do possible. So let's start with a really bit of simple bit of computer algebra. I'm doing a change of variables. Classic thing you would do in school is I'm going to replace all the x's here with u plus 1 and we get some new formula out. Behind the scenes, there's a symbolic representation of this thing. It's got this function plus, so a very Lisp-like notation. The markup's not important. This could be represented in JSON or XML. But it's a function plus who's got two arguments, one and another function, power of x, comma, two, and that represents this formula. So it lets us do this kind of substitution and transform one expression to another. But the language itself doesn't, while it knows about plus, it knows one plus one is two and all of these things about plus, actually the operation could be completely abstract. These things could be called f and g that it knows nothing about. It can still handle that in a totally abstract representation of a symbolic expression. So, so why does that do anything useful for us? 
Well, if we step away from computer algebra and take some piece of data from a completely different ontology, so perhaps from an engineering space, here is a 3D laser scan of my face. Sorry, I'm facing one way, so it's... I uh, can't do it in sync, but... Uh, so obviously it's a long way from this little polynomial that I did some maths on. But it turns out, because we've got a symbolic representation of 3D uh, um, CAD geometry, I can use the same operation to say, in this case, take all the triangles that uh, make up that and turn them into lines. So I've got a wireframe version, or I could turn them into little pyramids to make this um, sort of horror movie version of my face. It takes a little bit more computing, so here's the, my face made out of little pyramids. I didn't have to invent a new language for dealing with, with CAD geometry. I've got the ability to transform symbolic expressions, whatever they mean. And when you look at data more generally, in fact, you can usually find a symbolic representation for all kinds of different data. So we've seen the maths example, things like times and plus, and we've seen just the uh, 3D graphics thing, but we could look at, for example, a graph representation. And there we can have a symbolic representation, which is a graph of a list of vertices and some uh, edges with edge information, directed edges down here. So it's a symbolic representation in the same kind of abstract way. Uh, we could have uh, things like something from chemistry. So here's a molecule representing as a list of atoms with bonds between them. Um, we could have documents like this slideshow I'm using. It, behind the scenes, there's a symbolic representation of the entire document, all using the same kind of uh, serialization. And even this point-and-click interface I'm clicking on, it's a tab view of a bunch of tabs and a bunch of contents um, and has a symbolic representation, which means we've got a language that can deal with all data. Uh, all data is essentially the same once you've got a symbolic representation. You're not having to try and figure out how can I turn this into a bunch of string labels or in a matrix of numbers or whatever the kind of low-level language representations are that uh, are available to you. Um, so let's talk about a few things that this makes useful. One is, uh, is the very automation that we're trying to do to make it so that you can touch on different domains without having to be an expert is in fact made possible by the ability to represent all data in a similar way. I've got two examples here, but they're sort of a pairwise example. So I'm going to do a bit of machine learning here. Um, I'm just going to take a classic uh, example data set here. I've got passengers of the Titanic. So this person here was a third-class traveler, 29 years old male, and he died. And you know, the classic thing in machine learning is, can I predict what would happen if I were to travel on the Titanic? So first of all, you can actually see, uh, although it's not, you know, it's, um, it's a pretty small detail here, that we've got a symbolic representation of the task I'm not mentioning algorithms here, because when I ask it to do this task of classification, and give it a chance to think about the data here, um, we get this symbolic representation of a classifier back, and you'll notice the sort of automation is buried in the small print here. It says, method goes to decision tree. So um, it's used a tree-based method to try and uh, classify this data, and it's figured out that the inputs were nominal for the... Uh, the class, uh, numerical for the age, and nominal for the, the male. So it's, it's not had to be told anything about the method or the data structure because the data is just symbolic. It's, there is only one structure. It can then figure out uh, from the pattern what uh, to do with it, and we automate things like the decision of, um, of what method to use. Now, you might be an expert, and I might say method goes to neural networks or, um, or k nearest neighbor with a neighboring clustering of eight and whatever details I want, but I shouldn't have to. And so here's the effect. You get a classifier that says, I would not have made it. And we can drill into that a bit with, uh, uh, by asking why. And it says, uh, by this model, I had a, only a 27.5% chance of getting off alive. Right, so now let's step back from that uh, bit of, sort of text and number machine learning and do a different machine learning task. We'll do some computer vision. So I'm going to teach it here how to play rock, paper, scissors. I'm just going to gather a data set here. Hopefully, uh, I can line up with the camera here. Um, we're going to do, oh, I sorry, you need to say some rock. I'm just going to generate some label data here. So here's some rock images. We've got about 10 of those. And then let's have some paper images. And we've got about 10 of those. Probably enough. And let's try some scissors. And when we're done, that's probably enough. Uh, so all that was a little UI I put together to make this label data set. So here's my data that I've just captured. But the task here, because all data is the same, I can use the same function. I don't have to say, oh, we're in computer vision now, so I need to do something uh, um, uh, different. Data is just data, because we've got this generalized symbolic representation. It's going to do something different here. It's chosen logistic regression on some image features. And now, hopefully, if my demo works correctly, I look like paper, apparently, but let's uh, give it a rock. Paper 
scissors, and it's doing a reasonable job of predicting what I'm doing. So the ability to make this kind of level of automation and machine learning actually is predicated on this all data is the same. So we don't have to spend lots of time saying, how do I make a, uh, a matrix of uh, numbers out of that image and then dimension reduce it to features and whatever the steps are I need to do to get it to look like the other example or to make the, the categories uh, in my Titanic start looking like numbers. So that could be one, two, or three for first, second, and third, or this could be one and two for male and female. But I don't have to do those kind of jobs because the data is just, just symbolic data. Finally, a little bit of connected data. <laughs> um, so one of the things we want to do is do computation with the real world. And so we need a representation of things in the real world. And uh, we have, again, as you probably would figure out by this point, symbolic representations of the things in the real world. So here's where we are in space. This is a symbolic representation of a point on the Earth. It's a geoposition. It, it doesn't actually, let's just split this cell out here and evaluate it. You'll see it doesn't actually do anything. It's just a symbolic representation of a point. And we're going to use that for some computation to get uh, where are the nearest airports to that location. So here's the three nearest airports if you have to get away fast. Uh, but these things aren't strings. Let's just take one out here. Let's take this one out here. Oops, if I could select it and show you what the serialization is behind the scenes on this. Uh, it's got a symbolic representation. It's an entity of type airport, and it's, um, and it's got some kind of unique identifier in case there's more than one London heliport that we need to be able to separate it out uh, in some uniqueness. And if it was uh, London we were looking at it, the serialization would be something like uh, City of London, Greater London, United Kingdom. Now, again, just like the geoposition, this is just a kind of symbolic representation of a thing, but it represents a thing in the real world that then we can compute on. So I can ask for some computation on this, like what are things we might know about airports and get now the ontology of airports out of, uh, out of our, our connected data setup. So we can see all these sort of properties here, and I could say something like uh, longest runway length and get some value out. And that seems rather short. Oh, it's a heliport. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that kind of makes sense now. And you'll see actually sort of buried here is, uh, is you know, little details like this are all part of, um, uh, of, of how to make this stuff immediately computable. Because what I've got here is, an, is not just a number out. We need to pass all the metadata around. Now, I could attach that to, to the kind of ontology so I could look up somewhere else what are the units this comes back in. But you can't always have everything in a particular ontology being in the same unit. So you can't necessarily factor that away. You might have... Um, some information where you actually have different units for different uh, values that come back. So in order to make these things automatically computable, you automatically need to know how to deal with things like units. So if I wanted to say, uh, let's add 100 meters to the length of that runway, uh, you know, we need, the computation needs to know immediately how to deal with those kinds of things. Um, and so um, some of these things are, are straight fact lookup. You know, what is the conversion between, 100 meter, uh, between meters and feet? That's a straight lookup. If I did something um, uh, that isn't just a, uh, a, you know, a kind of RDF triple of, uh, in the database, uh, let's do, uh, okay, here's an example. Let's do $100 plus uh, 100 pounds. Whoops. And I seem to have typed a tick here by accident. Well, that, in order to resolve, you can't simply look up the value uh, out of a database you've got to go and get the thing live. So this thing will change from day to day because these things are shifting, shifting values. So we have to make sure that the lookup and where to resolve information is all part of the encoding of this kind of data in our ontology. And in fact, you can go sort of further than that and say, well, some of these things you can only resolve um, with computation. So if I say, what administrative division are we in? Well, you can't simply look up a value here because, um, uh, you know, there's well, not an infinite number, but rather a large number of points on the Earth to, to store. So we need to do the kind of geometry calculation of saying, right, we've got these different um, perimeters for administrative divisions. Are we within or outside of a perimeter? And it's found that we're within uh, three of these things. Um, and then all of these kinds of bits of information that might be used in computation, the ontology of the computation needs to understand the ontology of the data. So if I ask for a picture of this thing here, I can say I want geomarkers on my airports, and a line around um, this region, this last region that we've looked up here. Well, there are actually sort of different things, bits of information we need to retrieve. These are geomarkers want to be on a point. A polygon wants to be around a list of points. And so retrieving the right information from the entity is all, is all kind of encoded in, in the details of polygon and geomarker to know 
geomarker has to, if it doesn't get given a geo position, it needs to ask for a geo position. And polygon, if it doesn't get given a list of points or a list of geo positions, it needs to ask for those from the entity that it's been created. So here's the, um, the um, I don't know what, it's not a county, is it? Uh, what do you call these things? Well, it's an admin division that we're in. We, I guess we're about there. And there's the three airports that we just searched for. Now, all those examples, the, um, the entity is essentially just a name. It's just a, a label. But actually, entities need to be parametric, too. That, uh, that the, the border of a region, for example, might be time dependent. I doubt if Southwark's moved around too much, but it might have done. But certainly, some countries, if we look at what's the border of Germany, well, that's different now than it was in the uh, 1970s than it was in 1940. And so the parameterization of, of, of things like dates are important. Um, but also just, you know, we can encode symbolically the very query that might answer a question. So here I'm just giving a representation of an entity class, which is countries that meet some condition. Now, that's just a lazy uh, representation of a query. And I guess I could resolve that by saying, um, let's make a list of the things that satisfy that. And so here are the smallest five countries in our country database uh, by population. But by having a symbolic representation, it means we can compute on that. And it might be that if I have some complicated uh, set of joined up queries, that I can resolve a bunch of the information before I go to the data and do the expensive thing of, of doing the lookup, because I can actually compute on these symbolic representations of the data. Um, now, in the end, what we want to do is hide all that stuff out of sight. You're seeing the coding layer here that the developer types would use. But the idea of looking up a piece of data from a database is actually a computation. It's a query computation. The same thing as solving the differential equation over the Great Salt Lake is a computation. It just happens to be a mathematical one. So it's not always clear when you're asking queries uh, what kind of thing it's doing. I mean, if I pick very different examples here, what's, uh, I don't know, atomic, atomic weight of gold. So if I'm just putting this into Wolfram Alpha, this is basically just a query. We just have to go to the database and look up some number, and it's, there's a number. And then it's spotted that it's in uh, atomic mass units, so it's given me some uh, alternative units and equivalence things. But basically, it was a lookup. If I do something uh, a little bit more connected, I could do something like uh, weather in Rome when, uh, who? Well, let's see, Theresa May was born. Then to answer that, we actually have to touch on multiple different data sets. So the first thing we need to do is to decode the linguistics into a symbolic representation of a query. This is the kind of picture of the symbolic query that says, Theresa May, date of birth. That resolves to a date. A date and a place together with weather is something we can call a weather station and, and look up. And so here's our answer that it was uh, um, pretty average and dull on that day in 1956. <laughs> Now let's do one that's a bit different. How about something like, where is the ISS, the International Space Station? So this one does require a lookup. We have to call NASA and say, tell us where the International Space Station is. But, uh, and so according to what we've got here, it's somewhere over, somewhere near Cambodia, I guess. But the reason why I like this example here is that NASA's really rubbish. So it tells you a couple of times a day where it is. So this data point was based on some information that NASA last updated 7.4 hours ago. But this is actually correct. This is where it is right now, because in order to answer that, this is essentially a computational question. We look up the value and then plug that into orbital mechanics to work out in seven and a half hours it's gone around the Earth 3.1 times or whatever it is to arrive at the point that it is right now. So all of these things, there's a mix of lookup and computation. They were sort of indistinguishable if you think about them abstractly. Um, so I'm in danger of overrunning here. Let me do... Uh, Two more examples. I think I've got time to squeeze them in. So this one's really abstract. I want to go back to maths again here. But I've, this one illustrates one of the issues to do with anything we get back. It's nice when we get back a number and it says the answer is six. But sometimes the answer we get back is uh, kind of complex. So here's some pure maths, very pure. Uh, this is proving axiomatic systems. This is uh, an axiom system. So like arithmetic, two numbers add up to a number that adding zero to anything does nothing. This is the axiom system uh, the minimal axiom system for logic. So this represents everything that you, could, uh, you need to know about logic in one line. And we can ask then the question, is it true? Does it show that uh, A nand B is the same as B nand A? Which we know, but can we infer that from the logic? Well, we can run that. Actually, I guess I left that computation already run, but let's rerun it here. So it either comes back saying failed, no, or not. Or it says, yes, I've proved it. That you can now take this to be a true statement given the axiom system. So if all you want to know is, is it provable, we're done. Nice, simple answer, proof object, we're done. But actually, how do we understand that? Well, that 
object there is a really complicated thing with 102 steps in it. There's different things we need to do even just to understand it. So actually the answer itself needs computation to understand. So, but with these kind of rules for taking a symbolic expression and transforming it to another symbolic expression, you know, when, when you solve an equation, you take an equation and you get, uh, you know, some, uh, some number out. That's just a transformation. Well, I can transform this object into uh, a document because the document just is another symbolic object. So here's now the human written version of this proof. And, uh, you know, it's a bit of a challenge to follow. <laughs> but you can follow through all of the lemmas and steps and, uh, and conclusions. Or I could zoom out and say, well, let's turn the thing into a graph of just how these lemmas connect. And here's the graph of the steps involved in that proof eventually converging down to the conclusion. So some, very often these things you get back in, in themselves are just too rich to be represented in anything less than a symbolic uh, form. Final example before I completely overrun my time. Um, the model itself, the things we are doing is computation, well, they're symbolic as well, which means that just like we can compute any, on any piece of data, we can compute on the things that we're using to compute. So I brought a, an example of this. This is um, sort of back to machine learning. It's transfer learning. It's taking a model from somewhere and applying it somewhere else. So I'm going to look up here. We have a database of 100-odd neural networks. So I'm just going to fetch the database, the network. So here is the symbolic representation of a complicated convolutional neural net with, the net with a couple of hundred layers in it. They're in sort of 20 base layers, but then some of these things are little graph layers within them as well. So it's a complicated thing, but its purpose is to apply to a, uh, a picture and try and figure out what it is. So here we've done some um, image identification. I guess we could check that by saying, let's uh, query what we know about German short head pointers to get a picture back and see if it looks like the same dog. Now, transfer learning is to take what it knows in this pre-trained network and apply it to some new problem. So I'm going to um, make a new neural network that um, will know the difference between a good pet and a bad pet. Now, I don't know enough about neural networks to synthesize this thing from scratch, but it's a symbolic object, so I can compute with it just like anything else. So I'll just do a fairly simple few steps here, which is I'm going to take the first 23 layers of that net, most of the network, and then I'm going to stick on two... Uh, a, a, connected two layer to make it just two classes that come out, and softmax is a probability layer. So I'm just uh, ripping off a couple of layers and adding a couple of new ones. But because it's, um, it's, uh, because it's just another piece of data, I can compute with it. For example, I could say, let's just take the uh, first five layers of that network and apply it there and maybe turn them into pictures and see what the neural network is say seeing at layer five. So here's what's going on inside its mind. Well, here I'm just taking those five layers and adding a new one and then retraining it with some new data. Uh, dogs are good pets, cats are bad pets. And so it's going to take a few seconds to think about that, and I'm telling it, don't bother uh, rethinking what you see in the images, just uh, learn from the output. And after it's had a bit of thought, then um, that's, I'm going to run if I let it complete thinking, so I'll just stop it early and say, what do you think of that scary cat? Bad. What do you think of this dog? Good. And uh, we could take me and... And there's a picture of me, and I'd be a good pet. <laughs> Which is a nice outcome, because every time I tried this before, it hated me. Right, so let me wrap up. So my thesis is that data and computation is so much more. You can't just think about how you handle your data. What are you going to do with it when you get it out to actually unlock some insights and value and to make sort of actionable decisions from? And unifying data actually, in the end, requires some kind of symbolic representation of these very rich entities. Otherwise, everything just comes back to a number or a string that you then have to try and figure out what that means. And unified computation, in the end, means symbolic computation to be able to handle these different objects. Thank you very much. Do we have time for a couple of questions? I think we do. The question, the real question is, well, oh, okay. So there you go. I was going to wonder if if that went above everyone's head, but apparently <laughs> no. <laughs> Thank you. So I, I've seen similar ke keynotes from Mathematica uh, people before, and I always come away and it's always amazing. I always like it. And then I think to myself, are there, can you give other examples of systems outside of what you're doing with Wolfram, uh, uh, Alpha, that use a similar approach, that use symbolic computation as, a, as like the core fundament? Or are you the, all the, the people, the only people doing it? Sorry. I think we're the only people doing it. So I've seen applications of this kind of thing, but it's always, I mean, partly it's a selection bias problem. I see the ones built on our technology. 
And so I've seen all kinds of applications of uh, not necessarily building on the computations we built, but building on the kind of symbolic representation that we can make uh, uh, easy. And I know that you know, there's an old phrase about uh, any sufficiently complicated system reinvents Lisp at some point, which is a sort of a recognition of exactly the same point that I'm making, that uh, what we have here is a sort of taking the ideas of Lisp to extreme. Um, so I don't know of any others, because most people that get involved in symbolic computation, in the end, are doing it because they have, are focused on one single domain. Right. So they are computer algebra systems, or, or they're a proof system, or you know, some specific thing. And I haven't seen anyone who's trying to do this in the, as broad and generic as, way as we do. But um, um, that's not to say that there isn't one hiding out there that's internal to a big organization. Other questions? ton of knowledge in this and it's incredibly impressive. If I had my own database or graph store of experimental data and I've marked it up semantically in some way, how easy is it for me to bring that into what you've done at Wolfram? Yeah. So up until now, in, you end up having to build a whole bunch of connectors um, that you have to, in the end, translate. You know, the, the entity system needs to say, this resolves to this following SQL statement to fetch the right data from the database or, or you know, Mongo lookup or whatever databases your back end. Um, at somewhere around the end of the year, we're shipping version 12, which is trying to abstract that away. So there is a, a new capability where you basically say interrogate database, and it uh, generates you a list of all of the queryable terms and their, their relationships, the kind of foreign keys if they're linked tables, um, the ability to remap them. So if they've got dumb names, you can give them names in that query. And then the abstraction from saying entity value this, comma, this value, the fact that that might get translated into SQL or translated into Sparkle query or something like that is entirely abstracted away. I haven't actually used it myself in anger. I've seen demos and read a bit of the documentation, so I don't, I can't, don't want to personally say that it's going to solve all your problems, but uh, that's where we're heading to try and make. Whether version 1 does it or whether you'll have to wait till you know, version 2 or 3 of that technology is good enough, I don't know, but that, we're trying to make it so it's essentially automated. Okay, last chance, any last questions before we wrap it up? No? Okay, I guess not. Okay, so. thank you very thank much. You.